We're approaching a milestone. It's one of the tragedies in Western civilization and it is, it is perhaps the honorable thing to go into silence and fasting. Next week marks 10 years since I was denied tenure and Deep was permanently unemployed. We're not asking for sympathy. We're asking for, we're not asking for pity. Uh, we're asking for sorrow. <laughs> um, excuse me. You know, I think it ra ranks right up there with Mount Vesuvius, the eruption of Mount Vesuvius and the atomic bombing of Japan. You don't seem to agree. You're trying to I, su I do. You're suppressing I some laughter. You know what's the, the, the thing? I can't believe it's 10 years. I was kind of shocked. You know, when you get older, time goes so quickly. If you had asked me how long Chelsea Manning had been in prison, I would have said at most three years. Seven. It's seven years since Chelsea Manning went to prison. Yeah. Got out today. Yeah. Hard to believe. Does it feel like seven years to you? No. Three. Three. Okay, so it's not just a function of my age. Everybody's saying three. But I think it's using Look, if you asked me when the whole Chelsea Manning thing began, I would have said three years ago. Jack, what do you? Yeah, I would say about three years ago. So what, why, is it, why is everybody being here deceived by time? I don't know. But I was, I was kind of shocked. Okay. What? It was 2010. Mm -hmm. Okay. And no one was convicted in that mess. So he, that whole thing started just three years after I was denied tenure? I would have thought it was like 15 years. Three years? Very strange. Very strange. All right, we know. That's the way it is with milestones. 1789, the French Revolution. 1917, the Russian Revolution. 1949, the Chinese Revolution. 2007, I was denied tenure. <laughs> Moran, why did you lower your head? Was that an expression of sorrow? I'm crying. <laughs> Okay, so where we were in the last class, we were looking at Dostoevsky's claim um, that our reason is just a tiny fraction of who we are. And then Dostoevsky expands on that idea, and he says reason is just a tiny fraction of human history. So, let's see how he puts it. Okay, I think I gave somebody, this is what happens, they gave away too many copies of the book, and now I gave away the one which I had underlined. Um, cast a glance, let's see, I have it as page 37. Cast a glance over Mm -hmm. Why did I give it away? Son of a gun. Uh, let me see. Anybody see it? Cast a glance over the history of mankind. No? Hi, how are you? Let me... Mm, this is very, oh wait, wait, I didn't give away the wrong, okay, I have it. So it probably is 
Let me see page 27. Yes, I have an error here, so let's correct it. 27. Cast a glance over the history of mankind. Uh, who would like to read it? Oh, I think I'm going to read it only because uh, I skip a lot in this particular passage. Cast a glance, just cast your eye over the history. Mm -mm. Give me one second here because that should not be. Cast a glance over the history. Cast your eye. Variety, sublimity. Uh, right, wait. Just give me one half moment. Because I have two versions of my notes, which I keep confusing. Okay. Shouldn't be one second. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I think it's on 21. No. It is on page 27. Cast your eye. What is it? Somehow these things got confused. One second. Maybe this is. Yes, this one goes here. 14, 15, 16. I'm going to have to hold. I'm going to, I made two different sets of notes. And <coughs> 15, 16, 17. Yes, I, I'm right. <sighs> Got me nervous. 16, 17, 18. <coughs> Yes. Okay, we're set. I was right. It wasn't a mistake in my notes, because I don't make mistakes. <coughs> in 16, 17. Okay, pages 27 to 8. I don't like that. Just cast your eye over the history of mankind. Who would like to read it? James. Yeah. Good, James. What a relief. Where is it? Uh, page 27. It's about midway down the page. A little less, a third of the way down the page. Just cast your eye over the history of mankind. Just cast your eye over the history of mankind, and what do you see? Is it grand? All right, then let's say it's grand. Just think how much the Colossus of Rhodes alone is worth. It's not for nothing that Mr. Anyavsky testifies that whereas some people claim it is the work of human hands, others maintain that it was created by nature herself. Variety? 
Well, perhaps even variety. Consider only the ceremonial uniforms, military and civilian of all nations at all times, and think what they must be worth. And if you include civil service uniforms, well, the mind boggles. Not a single historian would cope with them. Monotony? Well, I suppose monotony too. Fighting and fighting. They're fighting now. They fought before and will fight again. Okay, so let's just stop for a moment. You're going to, you're going to continue, James. So, so far he says, look, if you look at the history of humankind, he'll say there are many grand expressions of humanity. There's a lot of variety in humanity. There's also a lot of monotony in humanity, among those monotonies being the recurrence of war and the recurrence of fighting. You must agree, go ahead. You must agree, it's already excessively monotonous. In brief, you can say anything you like about world history, anything that could be conceived only by the most disordered imagination. Only one thing cannot be said, however, that it's in any way rational. Okay, You'd you could say whatever you want about human history. But there's one thing you can say, according to Mr. Dostoevsky. You can't say there's any reason in history, any rationality. Go ahead. You'd choke on the first word. And there's another thing that keeps cropping up. Such moral and sensible people are always appearing in life, such sages and lovers of mankind, who have made it their lifetime's ambition to conduct themselves as decently and sensibly as possible, to enlighten their neighbors, strictly speaking, to prove to them, in effect, that it really is possible to live both morally and rationally in this world. What then? We know very well that sooner or later many of these philanthropists have, in their twilight years, betrayed themselves by committing some foolish act, sometimes of the most scandalous variety. Okay. So, claim number two, even those who claim to be carrying themselves in a rational, moral manner always end up, says Dostoevsky, compromising themselves and themselves acting in an irrational and immoral way. So, claim number one, search as you may, you're not going to find reason in human history. The notion that we conduct ourselves rationally, Dostoevsky says, on the personal level and on the species level, the history level, level of the you know, history of the species, there's just no evidence for it. And now comes one of the, uh, you know, I think pretty impressive passages. Go ahead, skip down to just one line. Yes, shower him with all earthly bl blessings. Yes, shower him with all earthly blessings, immerse him so completely in happiness that the bubbles dance on the surface of his happiness as though on water. Grant him such economic prosperity that he will have absolutely nothing else to do but sleep, eat gingerbread, and concern himself with the continuance of world history. And that man, out of sheer ingratitude, out of sheer devilment, will even then do the dirty on you. He will even put his gingerbread at risk and deliberately set his heart on the most pernicious trash, the most uneconomical nonsense, solely in order to alloy all this positive good sense with his pernicious fantastic element. It's precisely his fantastic dreams, his gross stupidity that he wants to cling to solely to convince himself, as if this were absolutely essential, that people are still people and not piano keys upon which the laws of nature themselves are not only playing with their own hands, but threatening to persist in playing until nothing can be desired that is not tabulated in the directory. And that's not all. Even if it were really the case that man turned out to be a piano key, and if this were to be proven to him, 
even by the natural sciences and mathematics, even then he wouldn't see reason, but would deliberately do something to contradict this out of sheer ingratitude just to have things his own way. Okay. Skipping back, I'll just reread it. Just cast your eye over the history of mankind. And what do you see? Is it grand? All right then, let's say it's grand. Just think how much of the Colossus of Rhodes alone is worth. It's not for nothing that Mr. Anya Efsky testifies that whereas some people claim that it is the work of human hands, others maintain that it was created by nature herself. Variety? Well, perhaps even variety. And he goes on to illustrate variety. Monotony? Well, there's a lot of monotony too in human history. In brief, you can say anything you like about world history, anything that could be conceived only by the most disordered imagination. Only one thing cannot be said, however, that it's in any way rational. You would choke on the first word. And there's another thing that keeps cropping up. Such moral and sensible people are always appearing in life, such sages and lovers of mankind who have made it their lifetime's ambition to conduct themselves as decently and sensibly as possible, to enlighten their neighbors, strictly speaking, to prove them, in effect, that it really is possible to live both morally and rationally in this world. What then? We know very well that sooner or later many of these philanthropists have, in their twilight years, betrayed themselves by committing some foolish act, something sometimes of the, of the most scandalous variety. Yes, he says, shower human beings, shower each of us with all earthly blessings. Give us, hand to us on a silver platter, the perfect world. Immerse himself so completely in happiness that the bubbles dance in the surface of his happiness as though on water. There he is living in that utopia, the perfect world in his jacuzzi with the bubbles dancing on the surface that he will have absolutely grow on the on surface of his happiness as though on water. Grant him such economic prosperity that he will have absolutely nothing else to do but sleep, eat his bonbons, his gingerbread, and concern himself with the cons continuance of world history. So there it is, Albert. You're in your jacuzzi. The bubbles are dancing on the surface of the water. You don't have a care in the world. You have been blessed with maximum total economic prosperity. You have nothing else to do. You just sit down and contemplate, ruminate on the meaning of human history, the meaning of life. Nothing else to do but sleep, eat your bonbons, play your porn tapes, <laughs> and concern yourself with the continuance of world history. Just sit back and philosophize. I see Jack, I see that look in your face. How you, how you, how you yearn for that. Yeah. Yes? Sounds pretty good. Sounds pretty good. And Dostoevsky says, and that man, Albert Jack, out of sheer ingratitude, out of sheer devilment will even then do the dirty on you. He will even put his gingerbread at risk and deliberately set his heart on the most pernicious trash, the most uneconomical nonsense, solely in order to alloy, to mix, all this positive good sense with his pernicious, fantastic element. All the gears 
are perfectly meshing and turning in this society. Everything is just perfect. And he says, out of sheer devilment, out of sheer ingratitude, he will deliberately set his heart on taking the monkey wrench and throwing it into the works and messing up everything. To alloy all this positive good sense with his pernicious, fantastic element. It's precisely his fantastic dreams, his gross stupidity that he wants to cling to, solely to convince himself, as if this were absolutely essential, that people are still people and not piano keys upon which the laws of nature themselves are not only playing with their own hands, but threatening to persist in playing until nothing can be desired that is not tabulated in the directory. And that's not all. Even if it were really the case that man turned out to be a piano key, and even if this were to be proven to him, even by the natural sciences and mathematics, even then he wouldn't see reason, but would deliberately do something to contradict this out of sheer ingratitude, just to have things his, his own way. I want to just, if you'll allow me, I would like to, because this, um, okay, if you'll allow me, I would just like to read um, here, I would just like to read the old translation. It's a little better, uh, so just listen up. Shower him, shower each of us, and I would like you to give it some hard thought. Dostoevsky is obviously saying, even if we had the perfect world, even if it was us within our grasp, we would destroy it. We would mess it up. In our heart of hearts, we don't really want it. We may like to dream about somewhere over the rainbow. But we don't really want it. Shower him with all his earthly blessings. Plunge him, plunge him so deep into happiness that nothing is visible but the bubbles rising to the surface of his happiness as if it were water. Give him such economic prosperity that he will have nothing left to do but to sleep, to eat gingerbread, and to worry about the continuance of world history. And, and he, I mean man, even then, out of mere ingratitude, out of sheer devilment, he will commit some abomination. He will jeopardize his very gingerbread and deliberately will the most pernicious rubbish, the most uneconomic nonsense, simply and solely in order to alloy all this positive rationality with the element of his own pernicious fancy. It is precisely his most fantastic daydreams, his vulgarist foolishness that he wants to cling to, just so that he can assert that people are still people and not piano keys as which they would be exposed to the threat of being so played on, even if it was by the laws of nature and so on and so, so forth. Okay, I want to look at those three claims. Claim number one, you don't see a history. Well, really two claims are important. Claim number one, say what you want about human history. One thing you can say about it, 
is it's rational. Claim number two, even if we had a perfectly rationally ordered society, we would, from sheer devilment, from a kind of ennui or boredom, we would wreck it. We would destroy it. We would take the monkey wrench and throw it into the works. Now, uh, in order to assess that, I want to compare Dostoevsky here is clearly trying to deny the Enlightenment notion of reason and progress. That humanity is applying reason more and more to its daily life as individuals and as a society and that in the course of applying reason to our individual and collective life there has been a steady upward curve of progress. That's the Enlightenment notion that if you look at the long term you know it's sort of like a version it's a version of Martin Luther King uh, the arc of justice, uh, how's it go? Uh, the arc of justice. The arc of history bends toward justice. Yeah, the, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. And that's just another version of the Enlightenment idea that uh, amidst all of the fog of history, you can still discern an upward curve of progress. So, I'll give you a typical statement of this upward curve of progress by um, let's see. Okay. Uh, let's see the source at 16. Here is 17, and here is, yes. Okay, so John Stuart Mill, who was a typical Enlightenment figure, he says in the following, I'll just quote him, and you'll get the idea. Why is it then that there is on the whole a preponderance among mankind of rational opinions and rational conduct. Mill takes the contrary position to uh, Dostoevsky. He says, if you look at each of us in our daily conduct and humanity as a whole, he says you will discover that the preponderance of our opinions and the preponderance of our conduct it is rational. Dostoevsky's claim that you can't see rationality in history, you can see everything else, is just not true. And Dosto uh, Mill goes through a long proof, which we won't det detain ourselves with right now, trying to show that in the course of human history, what you actually see is a gradual substitution of incorrect opinions for correct ones. Incorrect ideas for correct ones. That, after all, is what science is about. The gradual, incremental, admittedly protracted substitution of, or replacement of, or supplanting of, wrong ideas by correct ideas. And that, he says, is the nature of history if you look at it. So let's ask the first question. Let's avoid for the moment, well, no, we really have to look at his large claim. Uh, Mr. Albert, who do you lean towards? Dostoevsky, who says, Say what you want about human history. There's no evidence of reason predominating. Or John Stuart Mill, a typical Enlightenment intellectual, who says that if you look at human history, there's a preponderance 
of rational opinions and rational conduct and that what you see over the course of human history is the gradual replacement of irrational by rational behavior. Well, um, it's not like history is like some kind of scientific phenomenon. It's more like just like different forces over periods of time they tend to interact and uh, statistically they ended up um, with certain results as time passed by. So like clearly like um, for instance like since the Enlightenment a lot of rights have, have improved on women's rights, slavery, uh, racial rights and all those different issues and that also has to do not just with the nature of uh, of ideas and dialogue, it has to do with uh, social structures. Like, more, like, even if our political system is bad now, uh, the social structures have improved, where it's more easy to, for democratic deliberation and free speech, and uh, uh, so improvement, improvement in the sciences also, which has implications on our understanding of human nature. But of course, things can go backwards as well, because um, negative ideas can take root, and good ideas can uh, be shaved away. Like I guess, it's like uh, ne the neoliberal turn in since the Reagan and Thatcher years is an example I would personally. Come would up you with. say, on balance, reason does predominate, or at least more and more? reason is displacing unreason or you can't make an unbalanced judgment? Um, I would say for... Let me... Let me I, I guess uh, for like humane moral values, I guess I, I, I would think it's overwhelmingly towards the better ideas, more recent okay. ideas. Uh, Albert's verdict is, at least in so far as we consider moral structures and moral behavior, on balance, reason is predominating or at least getting the upper hand over time of unreason. I want to pose the question slightly more difficult in a slightly more difficult way for Moren. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure what it means to say humanity is becoming more reasonable. Uh, <clears throat> it's somehow well, that's not really it somehow presupposes that there's some meaning in life and we're, we reason our way based on the assumption of that meaning. But what if you reach the conclusion that life is meaningless? Then what does it mean to say we're becoming more reasonable? I'm not really sure what it means, to tell you the truth. While I was listening to Dostoevsky, I mm. thought of Descartes. I think, therefore, I am. So, I think, therefore, I am. Reason is not what moves societies and human beings. And then Mill agrees with Descartes. So, I think what they're saying is at different times, we can't say history from day one till now, at different times, given the circumstances, given their experience, where they live, their own personal look on history, they've come up with different ideas. But what's your view? My view is that we cannot generalize that history is. What do I know about history? What I read in books? If you tell me what I, <coughs> my own experience, having lived here in the Middle East, I would say yes. Irrational is what is the norm. But I don't know about history. Okay. Well, I mean, this, my problem with all of this discussion is 
if we're discussing things like reason or irrationality or or like history as if they're like these well, abstract scientific uh, <coughs> I'm looking at I'm not trying to I'm not I'm not myself fabricating a question. I'm looking at their claim. Dostoevsky, brick by brick, wants to take apart um, uh, this notion of the predominance of reason in human experience and then the possibility of constructing a perfect society based on reason. And he's approaching it from a thousand different angles. And one of the angles he's approaching it is, he's saying, say what you want about history, the one thing you can say is, it displays any kind of rationality. What do you say? Um, it kind of goes back to, I think, what you were just saying about, you can't really speak of progress without purpose. And I think that there's two sides to history, and... Um, you know, one is like in terms of ideas uh, where there is progress. You know, peop there's like this, you know, dialogue across the ages, whether it's philosophy or it's in science or technology, there seems to be progress in that sense. But on this sense of just human scale, you know, feelings and quality of life and, and um, ability to enjoy life and live a good life, whatever that means, I don't think there's any progress. I think if anything, it's it's, um, yeah, yeah. Why did you refer him because of the technology? Huh? Because I Yeah, I think possibly. Because what? No, maybe because of technology. Listen, technology also helps <coughs> provide a lot of good for people, but I don't think in with history moving forward, people are any more fulfilled or happier. Or, or, um, Let, let's just look strictly at his uh claim, are we more reasonable? Um, <coughs> again, I think, I think in some spheres we are, in other spheres we aren't. In spheres relating to, you know, even, even in terms of enlightenment, I think that idea-wise we may be able to be more in touch with reality. We're able to see through, you know, things that we were deceived by in the past. But in terms of knowing how to live better and being able to to you know, live lives that are that. Are I think you know we're not really he, moving forward in that way. He's looking at several categories. One, I think he's thinking in terms of moral values. Two, he's thinking about the extent to which we are victims of or vulnerable to all kinds of superstition. Right. The extent to which reason has displaced superstition as a touchstone of our daily lives. Um, but he's also clearly thinking in terms of this enlightenment notion that humanity on the whole, if you look at the long arc, I remember Professor Chomsky, he can be as, um, he can be as iconoclastic as one wants, but his his heart is definitely in this notion of progress. He will always insist, if you look at the long term, the, the long term curve, it's towards progress. We're getting better. Uh, and he'll always say, compare the United States now to what it was like before the 1960s, what the US was like in the 1950s. And he says on every level, you have to acknowledge there has been, whether it's an issue of race, whether it's the uh, level of women's rights, um, children's rights, um, on every level you have to acknowledge it's better. Is it great? No. But on the whole, we are, he would say, more and more applying the principles of reason to human life. It's getting better. Carrington, what do you say? Um, I agree that it's probably getting better, but I don't think it has to be that way. Um, I'm thinking of like Lord of the Flies, like you just sort of get out into like some new situation, and you would have, you could have the same chaos that you had 
you know, decades or centuries ago. Um, How do you feel about Dostoevsky's claim? You can see everything in human history, but you can't see reason at work. I mean, wasn't he the Christian? And it kind of starts with Adam and Eve. They got the perfect society, and they kind of messed it up irrationally, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I think people do that. I want to. Your name, please. My name is Dawn. I, I Wait, before, I'm just going to ask you, Dawn, I'd like you to look at the second claim of Dostoevsky, namely, I have a feeling, it's my intuition, I could be way off, but you've had a hard life. And so I ask you the question. There are many dreams you have. The dream of just relaxing, vacationing, not worrying, not worrying. Not worrying. And that feeling of happiness and contentment. And now Dostoevsky, he kind of makes a caricature of it but not altogether unreasonable. He says, Dawn, there you are in your mansion, your bubble bath, the bubbles rising to the surface, the bonbons or gingerbread in your hands, no economic worries ever again. You have, just like in Thomas More's Utopia, that was what we did earlier, where everybody gets everything for free. You no longer have any economic worries at all. All the bills are paid for. And Dostoevsky says, Dawn, you have all of that, but it's so perfect. It's so unblemished that you'll do to yourself what Michael Jackson did to himself. He had everything going for him, the wealth, the stardom, the talent, the fame. He had nothing to worry about, not a care in the world. He had his, he had his uh, what was the name of the place he lived? Neverland. He had his Never Neverland. Never. And what did he do? He started to go to plastic surgeons. They cut here, cut there, cut there, cut there, cut there, until he looked like a monster. He looked like a monster. It was terrifying at the end to look at him. And then he took his life. You have it all, and then you just mess it up. As Dostoevsky says, from sheer devilment, from sheer boredom with all the perfection, from sheer tiredness with everything going along perfectly. Everything, all the gears of society are perfectly meshing and you will get bored with it and destroy it. You may dream about utopia, but if it ever landed in your lap, you would wreck it. Mm. Do you think that's true? Don't be too, Dostoevsky, is, he's very seductive in his prose, but you should try to withdraw yourself from the seductiveness and think through, though Dostoevsky would say you shouldn't use your reason, but I'm gonna say use your reason. Think it through. You think he's right about that through your sheer devilment your sheer desire, your pernicious fancy, you'll wreck it. Is that true? Yes, to, I think so. I really think so. Um, maybe not in, on an um, mm -hmm. individual or a personal experience, like on a but I think I have maybe used those um, expressions, but not to, to the 
extent and the depth that you have said it, but I've always said like, when it comes to like a, a marriage, I usually say a marriage will be perfect. And, and um, everything is going great. Beautiful wife, children, doing great, and everything is just going good. And one person in the, in the home or house is just not contented, not for any reason, but just with boredom. They stepped outside and the floor steps in and destroys everything. So I think, from my perspective, I agree. Well, the same thing happened to Whitney Houston. She, yes. ha she had everything and then proceeded to destroy it. Yes. You get so bored with it, yes. you start taking drugs to amuse yourself because everything is just too perfect. Cecilia, we already know from previous classes, life hasn't been a crystal staircase, as they say. What do you say to what Dostoevsky is saying? That we would, um, he will jeopardize his very gingerbread and deliberately will the most pernicious rubbish, the most uneconomic nonsense, simply and solely in order to alloy, to mix all this positive rationality with the element of his own pernicious fancy. It would, do you think you would react like that if you finally found peace, contentment, no longer had to worry about paying the bills, no longer having to worry about a roof over your head, is what he's saying really true? Or is this some sort of artistic, artistic um, devilment itself? You really think people don't, if they had a better society, one which as, Mil, as Dostoevsky said, guaranteed us, granted us freedom from all of life's burdens, we would destroy it? What do you think? I mean, I think so. I think, um if you have everything, boredom sets in. And that shadow part of yourself, because you have all this time at your hand. As he said earlier on the pleasures, oh pleasures, you start thinking, well, I could push the envelope a bit further. I could open that door knowing what's behind it. I could push myself, you know, way beyond the peripheries. I could hang out with those people on the other side just because I'm bored. But uh, there, is an, there is, I hear every word you're saying, I'm listening to it. And she, uh, what Cecilia is saying is, when you've experienced all the conventional pleasures of life, then your mind and imagination start getting carried away, and you think about how about doing with two guys, or three guys, or an elephant, you know, or a goat. And, um, just to, just to, I didn't hear you. <laughs> I said that. I don't. <laughs> uh, just you want to push the envelope. But there is an assumption here with Dostoevsky, which I'm just not so sure is true. So I'm going to What's the assumption? Okay, the assumption is, if you lived in a place like Moore's Utopia, you'd get bored. But Moore said, you can attend lectures, you can read books, you can go to concerts, you can do all sorts of things which enhance you as a human being. It's not so boring, necessarily. I've seen many people who've had everything in, they, they wanted in life, and then they proceed to find all sorts of exciting and creative things to do with their life. 
It's not necessarily boredom that sets in. You knew Professor Saeed. He didn't worry about paying bills. He could just sit in his jacuzzi if he wanted, but he didn't want to. He wanted to play the piano. He wanted to read. He wanted to lecture. He created a rich life, even as he had everything. So why do you assume boredom is going to set in? I mean, that's Dostoevsky's claim that you'll get bored if everything works and you don't have to any longer worry about paying bills, paying rent, and all the rest. Why do we assume that? I've known many people. There are many people who were born into wealth and then proceed to do quite creative things with their lives. They didn't have to. They chose it. They made a meaningful, productive life for themselves. Why do we have to assume that if utopia were granted us, we would necessarily become bored? Dostoevsky says because we would want to alloy it, mix it with our pernicious fancy, our devilment. But you can express your fancy and your devilment in all sorts of other ways. It doesn't have to be a wrecking ball. It doesn't have to be a wrecking ball. People write books. People pursue hobbies. People pursue athletics. It doesn't have to be the only possibility if everything works perfectly is that you will turn into a human wrecking ball in order to alloy, as Dostoevsky says, all this positive rationality with our pernicious, pernicious meaning harmful, or harmful fancy. I don't think that's necessarily true, but I do grant, because I am no longer a polemicist, I try to see all sides in, my, these, in the last decades of my life, I do grant that there does seem to be a, a uh, reality that large numbers of people who had it all proceed to wreck it. It's almost, it's almost a cliche about people in show business. I mean, even I was kind of shocked, uh, great uh, I'm not a cheerleader necessarily for my generation, but I do feel like we did produce some really impressive cultural figures, and I include among them Judy Collins. I think she was just a great singer, as was Joan Baez, as was Joni Mitchell. They were really first rate. And last night I uh, stumbled on the internet on Judy Collins, who's so just really, in, in her, uh, I mean, I'm not worshiping her, but an impressive person. And then I read her 37-year-old son, she had one child, and the one child committed suicide. I'm thinking, how did that happen? And then it's sort of like Dostoevsky, or what you were saying here, the one child. She had one child. How is it you're born in her family, a really impressive artist and a decent human being, commit suicide. So there's something in what Dostoevsky is, that Dostoevsky is saying that I have to recognize there's some truth there. Next. Um, but, but I was saying um, when you come like, to that threshold, you can either dive into the abyss or you turn it around and you live a life that's in service to other people. And that's where you get your contentment and you don't have to um, engage in you know, boredom. I don't think it necessarily has to be in service to other people. Artists find other ways to express their pernicious fancy. They don't necessarily take a wrecking ball. But it is true, and I have to grant it, there are a lot of artists who do end up wrecking everything. I mean, because in, in I mean, I, it was, I, I've said it before, it was a complete enigma to me. How did Whitney Houston do to her life what she did? Here is somebody who's loved by millions of people, adored by millions of people, 
and ends up dying in a bathtub sniffing cocaine all alone. Well, I would like sort of disagree with that in a way because I think when you say like things like oh they have all these riches and they have all of these uh, millions of fans, like they have and then you put in quote unquote they have everything, but for them that's actually not everything. That's like oh many people who have is they they're in a situation where on their daily lives they're. They can't fully enjoy it. Like they, they have all these pressures, and they can't fully enjoy the simplicities of like daily pleasures and relationships. Uh, you know what, Albert? Uh, on this particular point, I would say I disagree with you. I don't think it's the pressures. I don't think we all have pressures. I, I think it's it's there. I kind of agree with Dostoevsky. It's that that. Uh, Pure devilment. You wrecked it. You wrecked it. What did he, Whitney Houston lack? She had love from everybody. She had money that you couldn't, you know, begin to calculate. I mean, um, no, she was not terribly abused. She she abused herself. You know, she was not terribly abused. There's no evidence of that. I've read a lot about her life from curiosity. It's just not true. I mean, when you talk about suicide, that's um. That's a tough question because you do not know what's in their mind. Because two weeks after my mother died, my brother carried her coffin. He bawled till he couldn't bawl anymore. Then two weeks after, he took his life. You know, so he, I mean, compared to my parents, he had a, he had a good life. He was a mechanical engineer, you know, works with Toyota. Every two years, he goes to Japan for six months. I mean, he did better than them economically. And he seemed to have it all, but my parents, they died a year from each other, 75, 76 years old. But he, by outward appearances, he had it all. But something just happened to him at that point in time, and he didn't really see, he entered maybe into that blackness. I, I would never know. You know, they, they found him hanging under, under his house. I mean, he spoke to me about maybe six hours before. And it, <laughs> can I die in day? <laughs> I really, I mean, I can understand. You know, sometimes I feel his pain, you know. I could see that we each carry demons. We have the devil on one shoulder and God on one shoulder. And sometimes the devil get the come up with us. I want to just give yes. some other people, go around. Deserve a turn. I got here 40 minutes late. I think that uh, I totally feel that particular feeling that when people have everything, they have a tendency of uh, of wanting to push the envelope, so to speak. But I think the I also agree with the fact that people don't necessarily have to go that route. But I think the fact is human beings enjoy the trip, they're good travelers. They're not good people that know how to land. So people that have an intellectual inclination or people that ha are into the arts, or let's say they have economically everything. And to us, it seems like they have utopia. The reason they go further and they don't sit in the jacuzzi is because achieving their spiritual or intellectual or artistic endeavor is not finished. So to them, they still have a tr road to travel. Other people that may be more shallow, so to speak, or don't have those kind of ambitions, they reach that particular point at the more earlier stage, and then you run into this exactly same uh, situation. So I would think that the compromise between the two opposing views is the travel is a secret, the process that we didn't land. Once we fully land, there may be a danger of boredom. That's one point one, which I wanted to say. And before I wanted to say is another thing also is I shared the idea that intellectual, that the world in general is going, if we want to take it collectively, towards reason. As a collective society, the reason is alive. I think more as an individual, I agree more individualistic with what Dostoevsky is saying, that the individual has the idea of sabotage. But collectively, since collectively the one opinion doesn't work, it has to be a tyrant or somebody to focus and control a lot of people, which usually doesn't happen. Therefore, the rationale collectively is bending in that direction. Okay. There's a, there's a really good like, documentary about Amy Winehouse. It kind of goes through her whole life. 
Um, There's a really good uh, documentary about what? Amy Winehouse. Uh huh. Um, just kind of goes through her whole life from a, a little girl, and also she dies in a drug overdose for part of anorexia. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, going back to uh, if we had the perfect world, the utopia to live in, no worries, eating our gingerbread or our brownies, if you will. <laughs> uh, sorry, I had to get that on in. Uh, in uh, uh, today, uh, Sweden, uh, from what I understand, has the ideal society uh, that uh, is socialist. They take care of the people from the cradle to the grave. But yet Sweden has a very high rate of suicide. So I just kind of wondered, it could be other factors, it could be the weather, the long dark nights, or whatever, I don't know. But uh, that about uh, having the ideal situation, the utopia, and yet people will throw a spanner in the works. Okay. Abdullah, um, you lived in Egypt. Yeah. A lot of poverty, a lot of hunger. Do you think Dostoevsky's right if things managed to get themselves set right there? People would wreck it from boredom? Mm -hmm. um. I don't think it applies in that in Egypt's case because there's so many things that need to get better. Uh, so it's n it's far from the perfection that would right. But if it were to happen, Dostoevsky is basically saying we have to be honest about what he's saying. He said, "Don't waste your time trying to make a perfect world because you'll wreck it anyway. So why waste your time? Is that really? I think is that really?" Um, I think what's Is that really good advice to be telling people? Uh, He's I basically saying don't waste time on your dreams because if your dreams were actually realized, you would be bored stiff and you would wreck it all anyway. I, I think maybe what he's saying is that perfection is unattainable, but I don't think that means that working for a better society shouldn't happen. I, um, I know, I think he's, um, he's trying to throw cold water on all of these notions which are rife in his society. Remember, he's living in Russia at the turn of the century. There are all these revolutionaries, these socialists, these communists who want to uh, create what's considered a new utopia, a communist world, and he's telling them, you're wasting your time. Because even if you had it, you would wreck it. Is that right? Or is that a very privileged thing to say? I think all I can say is that I think human nature doesn't change. And I think there's always uh, the idea of greed and envy and... Um, right, but this is not about human nature right now. He's, he's talking about, this, yes, it's about devilment, that we would wreck what, uh, we would wreck it, we wreck it even if we had it, so don't bother searching for it. Is that right? Isn't that a really reactionary message? I think. And it's also, in my opinion, a very privileged message. It's very easy for somebody who has lots of wealth to tell everybody else, don't search for it because you're not going to be happy anyway. Was Dostoevsky very wealthy? Excuse me? He, uh, he lived a privileged life in Russian society. He did. If being, ri if being rich was so terrible, then why don't the rich give up their wealth? I don't see them giving it away. They like their jacuzzis. They like their summer houses. They like their vacations. I don't see them so quick to forfeit what they have or distribute it more equitably. But then you could say that's just because they're greedy and anyhow they're unhappy inside and maybe there's an argument there. I don't know. What do you say, Jack? Um, I, I don't know. I, I think maybe uh, 
Well, what, one thing that seems to be lacking from his vision of a utopia, you know, sitting around eating gingerbread and stuff, he doesn't say much about social ties, which is something that I, I think rich people flip out like, like Michael Jackson didn't really have either, right? He had all these people sucking up to him, but he didn't have anyone who really cared about him. I don't know, I think that would be a, a big element of, of utopia. And I don't think life would be that boring if you had a spouse and kids who you, you loved and cared about, right? It would be harder to destroy something like that out of boredom. Okay, uh, that's an argument <clears throat> that hasn't been mentioned, that Dostoevsky's vision here, as it is throughout actually, is very individualistic. He doesn't mention the kinds of gratifications and pleasures people would get in a utopian society from family, from children, from significant other. Uh, doesn't necessarily get so boring if you have grandchildren, if you have children, if you have time for hobbies. Would you necessarily be bored, as Dostoevsky claims. Okay, um, let me now turn to page 30 to 31. I agree that man is above all. I agree that man is above all. Uh, page 30, wait, let me just, yes. Uh, all the way down, who would like to read? James. Oh. James, this is your life. From behind the camera to in front of the camera, the story of James Green. I agree that man is, above all, a predominantly creative animal, condemned consciously to strive towards a goal and to engage in the art of engineering that is eternally, unceasingly constructing a road for himself wherever it may lead. And the reason why he perhaps sometimes wants to swerve to the side is precisely that he is condemned to follow that path and also perhaps because however stupid your plain man of action may be in general, he will sometimes get the idea into his head that this path, as it turns out, almost always leads wherever it's going to lead, and that the important thing is not where it's leading, but that it should lead somewhere, and that our well-behaved child, scorning the art of engineering, should not surrender to that ruinous idleness, which, as we all know, is the mother of all vices. Man loves to construct and lay down roads, no question about it. But why is he so passionately fond of destruction and chaos? Tell me that. But here I myself would like to say a few words about that in particular. Isn't man perhaps so passionately fond of destruction and chaos? And there's no disputing that he's sometimes very fond of them. That really is the case. That he himself instinctively fears achieving his goal and completing the building in course of erection. Okay, one second, let me just see. Um, okay, I agree that man is above all a predominantly creative animal, condemned consciously to strive towards a goal and to engage in the art of engineering that is eternally, unceasingly constructing a road for himself, wherever it may lead. And the reason why he perhaps sometimes wants to swerve to the side is precisely that he is condemned to follow that path. And also perhaps because however stupid your plain man of action may be in general, he will sometimes get the idea into his head that this path, as it turns out, almost always leads wherever it is going to lead. And that the, one imp the important thing is not where it's leading, but that it should lead somewhere. And that our well-behaved child, scorning the art of engineering, 
should not surrender to that ruinous idleness which, as we all know, is the mother of all vices. Man loves to construct and lay down roads, no question about it. But why is he so passionately fond of destruction and chaos? Tell me that. But here I myself would like to say a few words about that in particular. Isn't man perhaps so passionately fond of destruction and chaos? And there's no disputing that he's sometimes very fond of them. That really is the case. That he himself instinctively fears achieving his goal and completing the building in the course of erection. Okay, I'm going to just read a better version, if you don't mind, because that's not great. Uh, if you listen up, uh, who has a good reading voice? James, would you like to read? Uh, can you come over here? Um, okay. Okay, we're going to go up to here. Uh, but man is fickle. Let's see. The man is a fickle and disreputable. Okay, man is a fickle. So you're going to go up to here. Then you read, but man is a, this, uh, up to search for. And then he, li he likes progress. And then from here to he likes progress to... He likes progress and then up to joke, uh, amounts to a joke. Okay, uh, you'll find it. Listen up. I agree that man is an animal predominantly constructive, foredoomed to conscious striving towards a goal and applying himself to the art of engineering, that is to the everlasting and unceasing construction of a road no matter where it leads, and that the main point is not where it goes, but that it should go somewhere, and that a well-conducted child, even if he despises the engineering profession, should not surrender to that disastrous sloth, which, as is well known, is the mother of all vices. Man loves construction and the laying out of roads that is indisputable. But how is it that he is so passionately disposed to destruction and chaos? Tell me that. But on this subject, I should like to put in two words of my own. Doesn't his passionate love for destruction and chaos, and nobody can deny that he is sometimes devoted to them, that is a fact, arise from his instinctive fear of attaining his goal and completing the building he is erecting? Okay. Let's look at that first passage. There are several. We all like to set goals. We all set purposes and goals in life. But Dostoevsky says, even as we set goals, there is something in us that is terrified at the prospect of achieving all our goals. Because if we actually achieved everything we set out to do, we would be bored. And he says, part of our secret yearning for destruction and chaos comes from the fact that we don't really want to achieve what we actually set out to achieve. It's sort of like you set your mind on some goal and you just can't wait to finish it already. You have some project, some goal. It may be graduating college. It may be finishing your dissertation. And you want to finish it, you want to reach that goal but there's a part of you that dreads reaching that goal because then you're going to wake up in the morning and you don't have anything to do. 
So you want to achieve it, but you don't want to achieve it. But man is a fickle and disreputable creature, and perhaps like a chess player, is interested in the process of, a, of attaining his goal rather than the goal itself. You like the idea of working towards something, but the actual achievement of it fills you with dread. And who knows? Nobody can say with certainty. Perhaps man's sole purpose in this world consists in this uninterrupted process of attainment, trying to achieve a goal, or in other words, in living, and not specifically in the goal, which of course must be something like twice two is four, that is, a formula. But after all, twice two is four is not life, gentlemen, but the beginning of death. At least man has always feared this twice two equals four. And I, says Dostoevsky, I still fear it. We may suppose a man may do nothing but search for such equations. We do nothing but try to search for the truth. Crossing the oceans and dedicating his life to the quest, searching, searching, searching for the truth to life, the truth to life's purpose. And now he says in a great line, as many of the lines are great, one has to concede. But succeeding, really finding them, really finding the truth to life's meaning. I swear, says Dostoevsky, I swear he will be afraid of that. Really, he will feel that if he finds them, if you find all the answers, he will, have, he will have nothing left to search for. We're looking for all the answers. We're searching for the answers. But if we actually found them, or they were within our reach, we would dread the prospect because, says Dostoevsky, you will have nothing left to search for. And then he says, we, meaning people, we like progress towards the goal, but we do not altogether care for the achievement of it. We like progress towards the goal, but we don't altogether care for the achievement of it. And that, says Dostoevsky, is of course ridiculous. He's trying to show that everything about our life, how we conduct ourselves, we want to know the answer, we want to know the answer, we want to know the answer, but if we could actually find the answer, he says, I swear, we wouldn't want it. We work towards a, towards a goal, we work towards a goal, we work towards a goal, but we don't really care if we achieve the goal. And that, of course, is ridiculous. And then he says a line that I often think about. He says, in short, mankind is comically constructed. All this amount plainly amounts to a joke. Mankind is comically constructed. All this plainly amounts to a joke. We're playing a joke on ourselves, and life is playing a joke on us. We want, we want, we want, 
But if we got it, we wouldn't know what to do with ourselves. We're looking for answers, looking for answers, looking for answers. But if we found the answers, he says, I, sh I swear, he says, I swear he will be afraid of that. Really, he will feel that if he finds the answers, he will have nothing left to search for. We like progress towards the goal, but we don't actually want to achieve the goal. I know he says that's ridiculous and sure mankind is comically constructed. All this plainly amounts to a joke. Does that sound right to you, Jack? Yes, I mean, um, actually, he said um, that man builds, you know, and he said they're, they're, um, they're builders, but the constructing, the getting off, and the, um, and the journey. So, I mean, you're reading it, and I'm, I'm remembering what he just said. You know, we've got to build it. Do you think it's true that secretly, you dread the product, prospect of having the answers to the questions that you search for? I don't think so. Because when you get the, you, you know, like that commercial from years ago, yes, where is the beef? <laughs> oh, sorry, you're a vegetarian. Okay, where is the tofu? <laughs> <laughs> Is, is life just a comical joke? We're comically constructed. It's all a joke. We pretend as if we want something when we really don't want it. We're searching for something, but we really dread finding it. Dostoevsky is saying that, well, I think it's pretty obvious what he's saying. He's saying this whole conception of human beings as rational creatures is totally absurd. All of our whole, our whole existence is filled with contradiction and um, contradiction and irreconcilability. I mean, um, is that wait, 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 a couple of other, Carrington? What do you say to that? Um, do you accept what he's? Do you accept his depiction of people? I think he's right, but I think he. And I, I would interpret it differently. I think people need meaning in their lives, and that's why they kill themselves when they don't. Somehow, the search and the quest and building gives their lives meaning, and sitting around eating bonbons does not give their lives meaning. But are there all of these antimonies, contradictions that he depicts in human life? We like the quest. We don't really care about the result. We like the search. We don't really care about the answers. I just, all, I just man, I don't, Excuse me? I don't personally agree with him on that, but I think that we have meaning from searching for things. I'll tell you, I'll give you an example from my own life, which I have, it's embarrassing to have to say, but you know, I'm past midnight so I can say it. <laughs> um, I remember when I was a teenager and everybody thought that my political commitments were um, a phase. And I knew they weren't a phase. There was something in me that told me, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And a close friend of mine, her name was Maxine, her mother said, Norman, what are you going to do now that the Vietnam War is over? And so it was 1975. And I said, well, I was a little bit obnoxious. Um, I said, well, so long as there's hunger and suffering in the world, I have plenty to do. But since I devoted most of my life to that, I did have to occasionally confront the question of what would I do with my life if there were no longer hunger and suffering? Because that's all I did with my life. And so there was a part of me 
that embarrassingly, I have to say, it did react to Dostoevsky, it did resonate to what Dostoevsky was saying, that if all the problems were solved, you'd have nothing left to do. And uh, I think it's true also that we strive towards something, we strive towards something, you strive towards graduation, that graduation day. And then you feel so thrilled, and then the next morning you wake up and you say, okay, now what am I going to do? You, you wanted it, you wanted it, wanted it so much. I've done that, I've written several, I can call it books in my life, and I can remember in each case, I can't wait to finish it by, you know, after a few years, I just can't stand this anymore, I, I can't wait to finish it, I don't want to look at it anymore, I hate it, I hate it, I want to finish it, and I finish it, and the next day, okay, what am I going to write now? Got to find something to keep me busy keep my mind occupied. Is it all a joke? Are we comically constructed and it's all a joke? A tale told by an idiot. What? A tale told by an idiot. Thank you, Macbeth. A tale told by an idiot who is sound and pure. That's life. So far well, when you look back on a, a long life lived, what do you say? You agree with it? That it all amounts to a joke? Uh, uh, but going back to other thoughts that I had, uh, working toward a goal, uh, I think many people are afraid of failure, the fear of failure. Yes, I want that job, I want to be the CEO of IBM or whatever. But there's the fear of failure, and also the fear of having achieved that goal, a fear of disappointment, that it wasn't what they thought it would be. I think that these are some of the reasons that do hold people back. Marin, we're comically constructed, all of life is a joke? N no. And I think to me, the whole thing is abstract. There is a speaking voice that tells us certain things, contradicts itself two pages later, and it goes on and on. There is no other voice who comes in. There is no, not a single dialogue, not a single example of what he's talking about. It's all coming out of his head. And to me, it's not very interesting. These are ideas which are abstract. He doesn't give a single example of what he means by this or that. What does it mean that it is a joke? Give us an example that you have lived, that you have seen. Well, actually, in the next half, he does give an example. Well, I didn't read it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but so far, I mean, he, he, he does talk about a person who carries on in a completely irrational okay. way, One person. imagining that he was slighted when he wasn't really slighted, and then seeking revenge for thinking that this other guy is also focused on the revenge, and the other guy is actually not even thinking about him. It's um, okay. One person, but mm -hmm. otherwise, it is one speaking voice from beginning to end all coming out of where? That was uh, kind of like the answer, where? It's coming from the underground. That's where I feel like it's coming. <laughs> it is coming huh? from, yes, and the contradiction. <laughs> okay. But do you ever, do you ever <coughs> ponder? So just so, I, I read Notes from the Underground the first time when I was about 20. And it was a big experience for me. I really, it resonated very strongly with me. And again, going back to that concept of, of um, chaos versus pattern on the macro and on the micro, I, I look at my own life and I, for me, I see you know, a lot of thought, a lot of 
you know, analysis, a lot of pondering, but no pattern, no, no direction. It's ultimately being driven by subconscious forces that I'm not really in control of that lead me in directions that I don't really understand and, you know, like, I don't, you know, yeah, so I, I kind of, like, just again, reading this book, like, really gave me that sense of, like, um, a, a truth that's, you know, you don't really see a lot, but when you're faced with it, you see it, you, you recognize it as the truth. Okay, I want to look at that. Um, page, let's see, give me one second here. Because he's going to talk about that right now. Uh, after, t oh, after twice, oh, that was it. Page, one second. Get these notes. Well, I'll just read it from this section. Uh, it's not my day with too many, that's what you call over preparation. Um, he writes <coughs> After twice two is achieved, there will be, of course, nothing left to do, much less to learn. All that will then be possible will be to shut off one's five senses and immerse oneself in meditation. After twice two is achieved, there will of course be nothing left to do, much less to learn. All that will then be possible will be to shut off one's five <coughs> senses and immerse oneself in meditation. What's he saying there, Dawn? I guess, uh, I think that what he's saying is that he has done everything and, and uh, gathered these experiences and there's really nothing else that to achieve. He has nothing else. And if you, which I think I've said this, it's people do live, live these experiences as well. They have done things and after a certain time and place in their lives, that's it for them. And so I really agree with him on a lot of his, in a lot of his reasonings because I, ju I realized that even at age 30, you uh, have all this energy and you would like to do certain things. And as time goes, you, even though you're still ambitious, you still don't have that drive. But you might just want to live the experience, but the drive is not there. I don't know. So I'm saying that that's it for him. He, all this experience and there's nothing else. No, more than to just, you can't do anything else. Okay, let me just read what he has to say on the subject. Um, and why are you so firmly and triumphantly certain that only what is normal and positive, in short, only well-being, is good <coughs> for men? Is reason mistaken about what is good? After all, perhaps Prosperity isn't the only thing that pleases mankind. Perhaps he is just as attracted to suffering. Perhaps suffering is just as good for him as prosperity. Sometimes a man is intensely, even passionately, attached to suffering. That is, a fact. About this, there is no need to consult universal history. Ask yourself, if you are a man and have ever lived even in some degree, as for my own opinion, I find it somehow unseemly to love 
only well-being, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, smashing things is also sometimes very pleasant. And then he says, all the same, I am certain that man will never deny himself destruction and chaos. So now Dostoevsky is bringing to bear two other of our irrational impulses. We like to suffer. We enjoy martyrdom. There is a certain pleasure to be found in being martyrs, in suffering. And we also, he says, in this do enjoy destruction and chaos. He says, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, smashing things is also sometimes very pleasant. I am certain that man will never deny himself destruction and chaos. So now Dostoevsky is escalating the argument. What do you mean you want to create a society in which our well-being is preserved and ensured? Maybe he says, we don't want well-being. Maybe we like suffering as much as we like well-being. Maybe we also have a destructive impulse such that we enjoy smashing things. He says, try, he says, try to create a utopia. He says, I say it can happen because we like destruction and chaos. We like that as much as we like well-being and perfection. Is that true? It's almost as if to say we don't really want to abolish war, because even if we were to succeed in abol abolishing it, there's some kind of thrill, some sort of pleasure to be derived or is derived from war, and we would secretly yearn for it and probably contrive ways to create it. That's what he's saying. We like suffering. Do you think the people in Syria derive a certain pleasure from their suffering? Do you think if they finally found peace, they would, as Dostoevsky says, they will never deny themselves destruction and chaos. They would seek out again the destruction and chaos of war. Is that true? I mean, as I said, the language is seductive, but is it true? I, my parents went through a war. I didn't see them yearning for destruction and chaos in the 40 years after. And they had a good share of suffering, and I think they would have been perfectly happy <laughs> if they didn't experience that suffering. But there's also a truth, to, there is an element of truth which we have to be honest about. There is a certain pleasure that comes from martyrdom. <laughs> Christ had a little thrill at the cross. Cecilia, you disagree with that? Once again, I'm just confused about when you talk about power, right? 
when you bring in war, it sort of puts in the notion of, it goes beyond someone deciding their own self-destiny and it's sort of someone asserting themselves over others. I, I don't, I, it just, something starts to explode in my brain, doesn't add up. Okay, um, that's just one point. Well, he's saying we have, I mean, <coughs> nobody's going to deny, I think, here he's, he's saying we all have a sadistic impulse and we all have a masochistic impulse. What is masochism? It's the pleasure to be derived from suffering. Everybody will acknowledge there's a certain element in them that derives pleasure from being humiliated and degraded. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. I think this exclude women all along. Mm -hmm. We is men, yes, and I would agree. <laughs> but women are excluded. Uh, I think the Maren, you have a very limited, finite imagination. I won't, I, won't, I won't pursue it. I will simply assert it. I agree with you. Very limited. The one thing that I noticed about the, the character that he uses to bring out these arguments is someone who's sort of obsessed with what others think about him. And so he, he had early ostracized, like he was ostracized from a very young age, right? He's a schoolboy who enters a school and he's, sh he's shunned from the get-go. So he never really has access to any pathways to any kind of crystal palace. So it, to me, you know, there's almost the straw man's argument that he's creating on the other side, a little bit. Because his own biases just sort of flood and, and, and he's doing it on purpose almost to kind of create this character that's easy to kind of... But I don't think it's, that. you know, to in me. fairness, and we have 10 minutes and I'd like to go around the room. Um, Dostoevsky has um, conjured, I think, a pretty compelling <coughs> argument, though not necessarily the last word on the subject. If we were to summarize what we went through today, he said that, um, well, to go backwards, he, oh, well, let me go forwards, just give me one moment. To summarize it, he says, that, even if we achieved the perfect world, we would be bored by it, shower him with earthly blessings, and he would become bored and he would wreck it. He says that we like, uh, we like the idea of achieving things, but we don't really want to achieve them. We like to search for answers, but we really don't want the answers. We say we want our well-being, but we like suffering. He says that we want peace, but we like destruction and chaos. And so when you add the whole picture, he says the idea of trying to create a utopia makes no sense. Why are you investing so much in trying to make a better world if we're not going to really be happier in a better world. What do you say to that, Albert? Has Dostoevsky convinced you that the idea of striving towards a better world is pointless? Well, I mean, my, that would be a whole, like, I would go on a whole other end about why I don't like the structure of this dialogue. But then, to answer it directly, I think I think once you have in mind like a world, like a certain image of what kind of uh, picture of the world that, that reflects your desire, I think it's no longer about human beings. For, so if I create a better world and like that restructures society in a certain way and produces certain conditions, you can argue, oh, like, like during that time period, someone is just gonna wreck it. Well, what about all the millions of people who they were given the opportunity to uh, pursue better lives 
and became happy as a result. Yeah, but the problem is, you see, I think the problem, Albert, is the language you use. Dostoevsky rejects the idea of what you called better lives. Let's say everything that Moore conjures in Utopia or Bernie Sanders sets out in his agenda. Let's say it were all true. We had universal health care. We had universal free education. Everybody had a job. There would be peace on earth. It would be like the Broadway show Hair when, uh, when uh, peace aligns the planet and love steers the stars. This is the warning of the age, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Aquarius. We have the peace and we have exactly what Bernie projects. That's not and, what I was trying to say. And then, what? I thought that's not what I was trying to say. But you said a better world, and Dostoevsky's not well, convinced. He's not convinced it would be a better world because he doesn't, he's not convinced we would be happier. And then you take all the cases of the people who have it all and end up destroying themselves. So if a, if a black man, well, he grows up in a happy family and uh, becomes like a scientist and is, feels generally satisfied and happy with his life and then dies, that's not a better, that's not, he, he, is, the society is not, doesn't produce better conditions than, than, what, than if he was in slavery? I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I think that will, will I think there is a case to be made that if everything were perfect, then we would only have one thing left to do, and that's to confront our mortality. And that shatters everything. So I sometimes think maybe there's some cosmic force that creates all of these obstacles in life so as to preoccupy us so that we won't be fixated on the big one. But if there are no, if, there, if we were just, if we were just sitting in that jacuzzi with the bubbles rising to the surface and eating bonbons, at some point in that jacuzzi you're going to be saying, oh my God, I'm going to die. So we really don't want that that's perfect life. Well, that's assuming that you're afraid of life. Plenty of people aren't. Plenty of people aren't? Yeah. No. Well, Albert. I mean, like, not in the sense that you're... Albert, if you mean four out of seven billion, maybe <laughs> you have an no, argument. I, I mean, not in the sense that you're talking about, like, death anxiety. I wouldn't call it death anxiety. I would call it mortality and the horrors that it necessarily attends. But why is, why is there fear of death? This is part of the life cycle. All right. Um, Anna, and that is such a rational statement. <laughs> That's a two plus two response. Well, you told me I'm a conformist. <laughs> if I were a conformist, I wouldn't be in your class, Norman. <laughs> what? If I were a conformist, I wouldn't be in your class. <laughs> no, I'm saying that because that's exactly what Dostoevsky is arguing against. Your answer is, well, it's part of like the laws of nature, and since it's 2 plus 2 equals 4, since it's part of the life cycle, human beings will simply accept it. But he says that's just not true. It may be part of the life cycle, but whoever said human beings are, um, are, uh, are willing to acquiesce to the life cycle. There's part of us that resists it. There's just, you, you can convince a person about the laws of gravity till the end of time, but it doesn't necessarily mean they accept it. Yes. I want to say also, adding to the argument, that our whole understanding of peace 
is in contrast to war. Our understanding of good is in contrast to bad. There's something inherent in our language, in our psyche, in our thinking, that even in the abstract, without the actual war, we need the idea of bad to, to contradict it. I have it. never, I've, so, I've, I know that argument, but I've never seen the, 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 I've never been convinced by it. Do I really need to eat dog feces to enjoy cheesecake? No. But, but, but in, a, in a grand scale, you live in a, t in a you, you, get, you get born into an, uh, in the perfect sort of uh, utopia, and you don't have anything to match it against. You must, let's say if there is a bad society versus mm -hmm. a good society, you would have that thing. If you really are creating this perfect world, then we would have the problem. Today, that, given that example, we have many relative terms to understand what bad is, so we don't have to go down to that particular level. But you, we're talking about the creating a utopia where people get brought up and even to explain that the life is good, to argue, we would have to give him some sort of other idea somehow to be able to understand what good means. If not, it would be, it would be monotone, it would be something without even having the right words, the right thinking. We need the contrast to understand, that's how we understand. That's how we give you know, an example. We're, we're getting a little short on time, but I, I, I have to say, I, I, I'm trying to be concrete in my mind as you say that. Uh, here I kind of agree with Moren. These are abstract propositions. Did my parents need to experience war to appreciate peace? I don't think so. But there had to be some, the concept no. of war had to be there, not specifically for them. No. Talking about a utopia, if the world was running for 100 years, there's no concept of war, no concept of boredom, no concept of anything bad, everybody's moral, everything is running like a machine, like mm -hmm. a piano. Yeah, that's what he says. Would we understand then what good means? I don't think we would understand what good means. We would barely would understand what war means. In this ideal world. You are right that when things the world is not ideal, we constantly have chaos. We no need an exact experience of war in order to talk, speak about war. It may even be a generation before it's close enough for us to feel it. But if you want to take a utopia, I understand then there will be a little more complicated. I, and I'm just adding to that. I, 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 just, I, understand, more right. I understand what you're saying and I, I, have, I, I have to ponder it. But um, I would say I'm, I'm not yet convinced. I mean, I've, I've never experienced war personally, and I don't feel any loss or deficit not having experienced it. It's enough to just imagine it for me not to want or need to experience it. I've never experienced poverty or hunger but I never felt I needed that experience and to appreciate having a roof over my head and um, uh, food on the table every morning. I, I'm, I'm not sure. <coughs> I, I understand what you're saying, but um, um, I don't know. Can I just say something quickly? Mm -hmm. um, when I was living in Denmark, uh, the uh, seniors had the highest quality <coughs> Sorry, his seniors had the highest quality of life in the country, in the, in the world, and they had the highest suicide rate. Yes, I, um, somebody mentioned that with Switzerland. And but it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah.